Every so often, I think people lose sight of what's important. And I make this mistake all the time, okay? With the invention of the internet and all the communication avenues that were created with this zero to one invention, this also created a lot of distractions for humans in society. Again, like I said, I feel like people miss what matters the most. And I think after doing some research that Ethereum matters the most. I know I talk about all of these other layer ones, these layer two scaling solutions, metaverse cryptocurrencies, and all of this opportunity happening in the cryptocurrency space all the time. I make so many videos about it, but Ethereum is still my biggest holding in the market. And Ethereum just did something it hasn't done in years. Ethereum has made a move that it hasn't done in 1,298 days. So in this video, we're gonna be doing a breakdown analysis of Ethereum in extreme detail. I'm gonna go over all the reasons why it's valuable. And of course, I'm gonna break down my research baby style. Keep watching the video. What's going on everybody? Alex back with another video. And yeah, I feel this is true. I feel like a lot of people have shiny object syndrome, you know, the next best thing. Uh, they're chasing this endorphin rush to their brain because of something new, new shiny objects everywhere in the cryptocurrency space. We saw this in 2017 with the ICO boom. Uh, we see this now with meme coins, you know, metaverse gaming tokens, other options for layer ones. We see layer two adoption. We have all these cryptocurrencies. I mean, you could pretty much print as many as you want. There's hundreds and thousands of different cryptocurrency options. So I do think people lose sight of what really matters. Uh, Ethereum really just made a move. Uh, so we're going to be going to all those details on why I think I'm pretty bullish for Ethereum. I'm not going to get rid of all my ETH holdings for another layer one. I'm still going to keep it as the dominant cryptocurrency in my portfolio. Remember, guys, maybe I'm emotional, but I got into Ethereum at an average price of about $5 originally back in 2016, 2015 uh, with mining, with my GPU miners. And this is what originally started me in my cryptocurrency journey. So it's near and dear to my heart, but obviously I'm not trying to be emotional. From a literal perspective, it's making some moves as we speak and we can use it as an indicator for other things. So I wanna be clear with you guys. We're gonna be talking about the potential of Ethereum, but there's different narratives that arise when thinking about Ethereum and thinking about Bitcoin that you can benefit from. And I use Ethereum as a massive indicator, especially for all coins in this you know, cryptocurrency space. And I think it could be very useful of you guys kind of knowing how I analyze these things. So of course, analyze the like button and subscribe to the number one cryptocurrency channel by value. I have the handsomest, mustache and i'm a quadrillionaire uh you know i was just a genius since you know i was two years old i was uh okay i don't know how they do the jokes i don't know how to do it i just know how to make money so if we come over here we look at this chart here i was not lying to you ethereum hasn't breaking out of this kind of resistance we see here since back in 2018 uh so you can see it right there 1298 bars or 1298 days uh, we recently seen this push and I, I talked about this in some other videos and maybe you don't want to call it a breakout. Maybe it's not a breakout yet. Maybe it's too soon to confirm this, but regardless, it hasn't gotten to this level in 200 days. So this is definitely a big event for Ethereum and you need to pay attention. You can see that we're looking at Ethereum versus the Bitcoin chart. So this is very big. This is one of the most important charts in cryptocurrency. And a lot of people are watching it right now as we speak. Um, if this chart goes up, that means Ethereum is beating Bitcoin by percentage gains. When this chart goes down, that means Bitcoin is beating Ethereum uh, by percentage gains. And you can see that it's been on an uptrend since over here, since 2019 to 2020. If you hold Bitcoin this whole time, you know, basically you would have been a dinosaur and you would have been way better off. And this is why Ethereum is my biggest holding. You'd have been 377% better off if you would have just held Ethereum. Okay. Now I want to really quickly, before we jump into, uh, you know, exactly what Ethereum is doing, uh, in the future to uh, scale as well as, you know, how they're going to get more adoption um, and some network effects and stuff like that. I do want to briefly talk about two narratives because I think they're extremely important. So if you guys understand what cryptocurrency is from a foundational level, 
uh, it gets pretty deep. So for example, if you come from a background with traditional finance and maybe you've been in the markets for 20 years and you come into cryptocurrency, it's going to blow people away. They're not going to understand, you know, why these cryptocurrencies move. It's almost better if these people unlearn uh, when they're getting into this market. And it's almost like a strategic advantage for people that don't know finance when they're first getting into cryptocurrency. They typically do better because they're learning uh, from this market specifically. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, cryptocurrencies are typically adopted by narratives. OK, they're adopted by, a, a you know, a call to action, like a, a big foundational thing that you know everybody agrees with it's the community right it's the combined effort of a lot of different people so the biggest narrative in cryptocurrency right now by far is bitcoins you know hedge against inflation the world prints money they have control over the monetary supply bitcoin allows you to exit that system and this is what most people can get behind. Most people with a lot of money, most people that don't know anything about finance, this is typically their starting path into the cryptocurrency journey or historically has been the starting path. And you know this is true because Bitcoin has pretty much zero utility compared to some of these altcoins that are coming out. Bitcoin is very slow, very expensive. There's no smart contract capabilities. It hasn't been upgraded since it started. Uh, so, I mean, we just had the taproot upgrade, but I'm talking about hard fork, hasn't hard forked or done anything significant since it started. But yet, it is the biggest cryptocurrency on the market. They have the strongest narrative. People hold Bitcoin through the bear run. People don't hold some of these altcoins we're talking about on the channel through the bear run. And this is why I always say it's for quick profit. My goal is to increase my Ethereum stack and my Bitcoin stack. It's that simple. That's the only reason I buy any of these altcoins. And that is not going to change. I will never hold these altcoins through the bear run. I want to be very clear with everybody watching my videos so that you don't get misled. I talk about the altcoins because I don't want to be a dinosaur and I'm open open to seeing new innovation kind of take over uh, some of these, you know, big prominent coins. But Ethereum and Bitcoin, are, it's where it's at right now. I don't care what anybody says. It's the safest place, the most solidified, and it's the best gamble. It's the most likely, you know, option for uh, mass adoption in the world. So Bitcoin has the hedge against monetary inflation. Now, Ethereum serves as the utility narrative. Hey, blockchain technology works really well. So you got two narratives. One's against, you know, all it does, hedge against monetary inflation. Ethereum number two is like, hey, we have this great tech that Bitcoin created called blockchain. It just happens to be that they have specific features like permissionlessness. Uh, we have, you know, high security, peer-to-peer -peer technology. All these crazy benefits can actually go into a whole bunch of different social structures. So it can go into something like a DeFi app or decentralized application that otherwise only would have been accessible to centralized entities, uh, people with accredited investors, things like this, you know, or a social media can be decentralized. Stop with the censorship, right? People are getting censored because of, you know, uh, political perspectives. There's different things or why or people are getting taken advantage of on these platforms. And we can decentralize that. We can get the same features that Bitcoin has and pretty much any social structure. This is the second narrative that is Ethereum is leading the show. And Ethereum um, you know, kind of made room for a lot of the layer ones that we talk about on the channel, a lot of the adoption that's happening and all of these other cryptocurrencies that everybody talks about is the utility narrative. Again, there's like all these micro narratives that happen like the metaverse, but metaverse is a byproduct of the utility narrative. Okay. Um, you know, DeFi is a byproduct of the utility narrative, right? All of these ecosystems, NFTs is a byproduct of the utility narrative, but the top narrative is, I said it like seven times. It is utility. So we have Bitcoin hedge against monetary inflation, superior form of money. And we have Ethereum is the biggest utility. OK, so people pay attention to what I'm saying here. Even if you don't buy one ETH, it doesn't matter. Obviously, it's not financial advice, but pay attention to what I'm saying, because this will move the markets and all other utility markets. Like if Ethereum is doing well. This builds it for all coin cycles. And if we bring back up the chart here, this is exactly what I'm saying. So regardless if you don't hold Ethereum or not, that does not matter. It's going to make room for Cardano. It's going to make room for Solana. It's going to make room for AVAX, right? So if we come over here, we look at the top 100 altcoins versus Bitcoin dominance. We talked about this multiple times. We're on the Midway channel here, and it kind of looks very similar. Not exactly. It's almost like Ethereum's a uh, leading indicator. But you can see if Ethereum breaks out, I'm definitely going to get very confident about the top 100 altcoins breaking out as well. If we look at the altcoin, we talked about this like previously in some other videos. I forgot to delete it. Let me delete that there. It played out exactly how we were talking about before. And we have something similar to another falling wedge that might be breaking out right now as we speak. Also, we have this long line of support. However you want to draw it, you can draw it here. 
you could draw it here. But in general, all coins have been doing pretty well, right? Um, and it's because Ethereum is making way. And if we look at Matic, which is a layer two on Ethereum, and I would say the biggest leading indicator for layer twos, this has been on an upwards trend too, right? And if we look at just what happened today, with Ethereum coming up to this mark, it popped up 15%. Ethereum's coming up to the mark, trying to break all-time high when it comes to ETH BTC chart, right? Trying to, trying to break this all-time high. And we see Polygon doing well. So this is a perfect example of what I've been saying over and over again. All coin season gets built off of the utility narrative. And Ethereum is the prime indicator for this utility narrative. So pay attention to what's going on. And of course, we have all this competition. And so I want to attack it from different perspectives, right? So we have all this competition. And I think this is the only thing that is beating... Right now, Ethereum, obviously you have, you know, the, the faster transaction speeds and the, the you know, cheaper costs. Um, but I think the biggest kind of combination of all of that is the ROI, how much money you're making. Uh, this is the biggest, uh, I guess you could say strategic advantage for the competition. But in general, all layer two adoption is happening on ETH, guys. Arbitrium, Bulbo, DYDX. This is all ETH based. Okay, guys. Um, so... This is what's going to play out in the future for Ethereum adoption. Remember, they're all integrating on the layer one ETH. Uh, so this is just a crazy upward trend, $6.91 billion TVL. When DeFi specifically passed 1 billion TVL, I was celebrating. We have $6.19 billion in layer twos. This is ridiculous. I never thought this would have happened this quick, you know, back in the day. Um, and if we look, just kind of adding to what I'm saying here, you know, the Ethereum use case of layer two integrating with Ethereum, uh, you know, Ethereum is just destroying when it comes to total value locked in general by any layer one avalanche, Terra, Solana, you know, Polygon, even uh, Binance Smart Chain. Ethereum is destroying them all and it's not even close. OK, it's not even close. So definitely, again, shiny objects everywhere. But pay attention to what's really happening here on a massive scale. All right. If we look a little bit deeper, you can look at kind of the number of active addresses. Uh, so we can see kind of like how it compares to layer twos. And you can see that there's been select times where people have actually used Polygon a little bit more than the Ethereum main chain itself. But remember, Polygon's integrated to you know ETH, so this is a positive thing. Uh, this is kind of going into the utility narrative where people are moving over layer twos, and all the layer twos are integrated on Ethereum. This is further use case for ETH, guys. Arbitrium, look, uh, 291,000 distinct addresses. Now, this is not uh, active addresses completely different. I couldn't find any data on Arbitrium's uh, active addresses. But you could just see the masses are moving in. Look, 272,000. We even got up to, at one point, almost uh, 500,000 active users. And if we look at ETH uh, from on-chain metrics, you can see that they're about 500,000. So Polygon passed it briefly, and they'll probably pass it again in the future. Um, some other on-chain metrics, if you look at Ethereum versus Polygon, there's way more transactions happening on Polygon. Uh, so this is adding to what we're saying here. People are moving to layer twos. The biggest, you know, DeFi projects, the biggest metaverse games are moving to layer twos like Sandbox, right? We've talked about this in previous videos. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that there's more contract deployments on Polygon versus Ethereum, way more. Look, there's 286,000 contract deployments on Polygon versus Ethereum. So clearly people are moving over to the layer two. And if we get the network effects on layer two, you know, this can change the game in the future, but for right now, Ethereum is going to prosper from this. Now, if we look at uh, Ethereum versus Arbitrium, we kind of see something very similar. In this case, we have way more transactions on Ethereum. Now, I want to explain a concept called network effects because I feel like people don't do it justice. I feel like a lot of YouTubers out there want to show these coins for, you know, uh, marketing purposes and, you know, they want to, to promise the world and stuff like that. But let's kind of just take a step back and, and you know, step in the direction of reality, right? So we have something called McAfee's Law of uh, Network Effects, and I've taught this a couple of times. Uh, but basically, just to put it very simple for you, you can see right here, it says a network's value is proportional to the square of the number of nodes in the network. The end nodes can be computers, servers, simply users. Um, for example, if the network has 10 nodes, its inherent value is 100 or 10 times 10 equals 100. Uh, add one more node and the value is 121. Add another and it's 144. So it's nonlinear, but exponential growth. And this is huge because Apple, the biggest companies you guys know, like Microsoft, they achieve parabolic growth. If your company is growing linearly and you have a company right now and you guys are just kind of going up and you're not going parabolic, there's a good chance you could die in the future. We want to see that parabolic growth curve, which is like a, a, a kind of like half of a U-shaped 
growth effect. And network effects are a big part of that. So just to put it in simple terms for you guys, if I have an Xbox and if six of my friends have an Xbox, uh, we get a new friend and he asks us, hey, should we buy a PS5 or an Xbox? They're gonna buy an Xbox, okay? Because we all use it. Uh, you know, we have the community effect and, and we're all recommending it, okay? It's the same thing for Ethereum. You know, most people jump into ETH before anything else, okay? Not only that, but just look, the network effects of, for example, the validators or the miners is outstanding. Look, 300,000 compared, no one's even slightly close. Cardano has 2,000, that's nothing. Elrond has 3,200. They have 300,000, um, you know, validators and miners, as well as users, they have the network effects, as well as developers, they have the network effects. Infrastructure, they have the network effects. Why do you think that every layer one has to make an EVM compatible type of you know translator when it comes to code. They are trying to take money away or uh, they're trying to take liquidity and infrastructure away from ETH because they have built the strategic stronghold called network effects. And I feel like people diminish this. I feel like a lot of people on YouTube, they diminish the strength of a network effect. It's huge, it's everything. Even if the tech is inferior, and I've actually, uh, in, in the fundamental secrets, I teach this, there's been a scientific report that you know prove this system. I, I forgot the exact. It was like TPIS or something like that. I forgot the exact term for it. But you know, there's been other network effect companies that are inferior by tech, inferior by tech. Like for example, the telephone companies and stuff like that that got the adoption just because of the network effects, even though they were worse than the competitors. The competitors were like ten times better, and, and have more utility. But, uh, you know, the inferior tech won because of this network effect and do not diminish it because remember, you know, ETH 2.0 is coming. They just need to solve it short term. So the question really is, you know, are we going to get a layer one that's going to be, ETH, you know, in the next two, three years? And I think that's out of the question. I don't think that's happening in the next two to three years. As long as they can pull off Ethereum 2.0, you know, with other things like this, for example, and a negative issuance that comes from Ethereum, this is big. Look, net issuance per day. There are some days where we have negative Ethereum happening. The more the transactions, the more they burn. Look, negative 3,419 ETH. Uh, they took ETH off the market. This burning mechanism was so good for Ethereum that they actually you know, integrated it into the Binance Smart Chain, which is the second biggest layer one on the internet right now. And so I think it's crazy that they have this strategic advantage of network effects and they're burning to get more network effects. But I, I would say, uh, just to throw that out here, guys, the downside to having this burning mechanism is that if there's another blockchain that has more negative issuance, you know, then people are just going to migrate over there to the next best thing. Uh, so, you know, there's a negative and a positive, right? The negative issuance, you know, pushes Bitcoin up, uh, similar to what we see with the uh, Bitcoin having events, uh, you know, happen every uh, four to five years. Uh, and, you know, this has been a catalyst for Ethereum in recent history. And this is probably, you know, contributing to the reason why Ethereum is about to break this uh, resistance we've been seeing uh, since 200 days or uh, 1,298 days. It's kind of big, okay? So the negative issuance and the burning thing that happened with EIP-1559 is pretty big, guys. So pay attention to that. And there's also some proposals happening right now uh, with Vitalik Buterin that he might actually potentially make the transition uh, with fees in the short term easier for layer two adoption, like much cheaper. Like right now it costs like 100 bucks. You got to do like a, a serious transaction fee, um, you know, to get into a layer two, but in the future, he might drop that specifically for layer twos to force more network effects onto the layer two ecosystem. So that could be big. And then obviously we have Ethereum 2.0 happening. Total number of deposits, uh, 30 day moving average. We still have a lot of people depositing into the Ethereum uh, you know, uh, contract, Ethereum 2.0 migrating over to this proof of stake network that's gonna happen in the future. Now, if they're gonna do it or not, I mean, I don't know for sure. I mean, you know, people speculate all the time. I mean, Cardano investors speculate. I speculate on Cardano smart contracts. They don't have it out yet. So, you know, I would say that this is definitely better considering they actually have something happening uh, and they've proven they have a track record um, of proving that they can actually integrate things and build things. So, you know, people are still staking to Ethereum 2.0. This is still happening in the future. And I think it's going to be a big catalyst event for Ethereum as a whole. I think uh, Rocket Pool or RPL just came out with their main net. Uh, they're allowing you to stake with less ETH. So I only see this going up. Uh, and here's some kind of more on-chain metrics backing up what I'm saying there. ETH deposited right here. ETH2 uh, deposit contract. It's it's going up. Now, it's not going, I would say, uh, you know, exponential, the exponential growth curve we want. 
but this is still a lot of adoption happening as we speak. Now, I also wanted to bring up another point for a catalyst for Ethereum, and that's like the new trends that are happening now with you know the meme coins as well as you know the NFT drops that are happening, right? This is also a big catalyst. This is a big market wide open. Some people even claim that the art market is bigger than all of the financial markets, you know, which I agree. The gaming and the art and everything that's happening right now, you know, is definitely bigger in the long run, right? There's more growth potential for this trend to take place. Uh, and let's look at the biggest NFT sales right now. Every single one of them is either ERC20 token or on the Ethereum blockchain, Sandbox, Board 8 Yacht Club, Crypto Pumps, Art Blocks. You know, I get the whole, hey, go buy an NFT punk on Solana. I understand. But the whole point of, you know, the value of art is the fact that it's the original art piece. And this happened on Ethereum. The innovation started on Ethereum. If people just go to Solana for cheap transaction fees, then the next best thing is going to come around and then people are going to move from Solana to something else. Same thing with Binance Smart Chain. But this was birthed and still happening right now. The biggest people in the game are not buying. Well, they are buying, but most of their collection is on ETH, not these other layer ones. Look at everything. The biggest projects. Every single one of them is on the Ethereum blockchain. I'm just going to put it like that. Okay. Simple, straightforward. Um, you know, the value is being captured better with this utility narrative on Ethereum. I don't care what anybody says on the internet. Even, you know, even right here, as you can see, you know, Budweiser just rebranded their, uh, you know, Twitter handle, I guess, or their name or whatever the case is, to beer.eth. Beer.eth, not beer.ada, not beer.soul, beer.eth. People with a lot of money know what the deal is. And that this was also another huge confirmation for Ethereum for me, which is basically the fact that we had Dogecoin for years, for like almost as long as Bitcoin was created. And Shiba Inu is all, the only thing Shiba Inu has to offer is that it's an ERC20 or Ethereum-based version of Dogecoin and it passed Dogecoin. Now, right now it's a little bit down. Dogecoin's uh, market cap is 28 billion and Shiba Inu is 25 billion, but Dogecoin's on way more exchanges. Dogecoin's on the biggest financial app on planet earth and Shiba Inu is not. Dogecoin should be way further ahead than Shiba Inu and it's not. And if we look at the liquidity here, I can kind of back up what I'm saying. Dogecoin's on Robinhood. Uh, you know, Shiba Inu is not on Robinhood. When Shiba Inu gets on Robinhood, I'm like 95% sure Shiba Inu is going to take the cake. But this is kind of going off what I'm saying. It's like, look, Shiba Inu just came about, right? And Dogecoin has been here for so long, but yet it's very close to being the number one meme coin on the market. And just to kind of throw it out there too, um, you know, look at these, look at the top market caps of all these cryptocurrencies. Let's, let's go down the list. Which ones are ERC20 tokens? Uh, this is obviously Ethereum, right? Tether is an ERC-20 native token, right? If we keep going, you see USD ERC-20, right? We have Shiba Inu ERC-20, right? Uh, a lot of these are ERC-20. Polygon, and it was worse before, but obviously with the new layer ones coming out. Chainlink started at ERC-20. Um, Uniswap ERC-20. Axie Infinity ERC-20, right? So in general, uh, ETH has the network effects. Don't diminish what it is. This is why Ethereum is still my biggest holdings. Obviously, we have bigger you know, percentage potential on some other coins, but I put less money into those for a reason because I know that at the end of the day, you know, the goal here is just to make money and you want to keep it, right? It's not just about making a thousand X on your coin and then losing it overnight. It's about making it and keeping it. So from a conservative perspective, I will keep my holdings of all my cryptocurrency I would keep Ethereum at the top. Bitcoin is like second or third. Uh, and then you guys know, we talked about it in some other live streams. Phantom, you know, is one of the bigger ones. It's like one of the big layer one bets. But to be honest with you, I'm more likely to sell all of my Phantom and anything else I've been recently talking about than ETH. Because ETH, at the end of the day, uh, is kind of willing... It's kind of winning this utility narrative that everybody's pretty much adopting as we speak. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it for this video, guys. If you like the quality of this content, hit like. If you don't, leave some constructive criticism. Subscribe for more video updates. And like I always say, if you don't get with it, you will get left behind. Thanks for watching this, guys. Catch you in the next one.